Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and thank you for joining me for another episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called Alien Visitations, 10 Cases from Around the World. I love talking about UFOs and extraterrestrials. For me, this subject is endlessly fascinating. It's got so much to teach us, not only about life beyond Earth, but about ourselves. Today I've chosen 10 cases from all over the world, of course, and reaching back, back to the 1950s, actually, up through the 1980s, and 10 cases that I think are not super well-known, but ones that are definitely interesting, ones that have some unique aspects to them, cases that have something to teach us about ourselves and life beyond Earth. So I've got cases from England, from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, Australia, England, and the United States. And most of these do involve humanoids, though for good measure I stuck a couple of what I would call close encounters of the first kind, simple sightings, though as you'll see, they're not quite as simple as you might think. But yeah, super interesting. This again is my favorite subject, and I can't wait to present these cases to you today. And some of these cases are quite extensive. A few are brief, but I think this is going to be a longer episode. Always hard to predict. But let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about today, I call a close-up encounter with humanoids. And this is a somewhat brief case. But the witness saw this UFO and humanoids so close up, it removes virtually any chance of misperception. It's got some really unusual aspects to it, and it's just an all-around interesting case. It occurred on November 16, 1952, in Castle Franco, Italy, and I think you'll find it quite interesting. This case involves a single witness, and it is pretty brief, but it's also really strange. The witness's name is Nello Ferrari. He's a 40-year-old farmer who, on the morning of November 16, 1952, had walked away from the stables of his farm to go relieve himself in a pasture. And looking down at the ground, he noticed a copper-colored luminescence in a 120-foot radius circle around him. And looking up, he saw a strange craft hovering at a very low altitude, about 30 feet overhead. He said its shape was similar to two plates, one on top of the other, and they were separated by sort of a metallic section which rotated rapidly, making a loud humming noise. Now, more astonishing than this was that leaning out from the center section of this saucer-shaped craft were three humanoid figures. He said they appeared to be normal size, but were wearing what looked like a rubber-looking suit with sort of a transparent face mask. He said they appeared to be talking audibly, out loud, to each other, and he could actually hear these words, which really made no sense to him, but sounded, he said, something along the lines of Verin Erg Unch. So what that means is anybody's guess. But at this point, there was a loud metallic click, and the humming noise from the object increased in intensity, and then this object took off at high speed. Now, Italian ufologist Renzo Cabassi did do a follow-up investigation, and he learned, unfortunately, that the main witness had passed away. But according to his family, the farmer, Nello, was profoundly affected by his encounter for the rest of his life. Again, a pretty brief case. I wish there was more investigation to it, but it's really interesting when someone sees a UFO and humanoids that close up during broad daylight. No chance of mispercep per misperception. And again, it's sort of... <laughs> A cautionary tale is you never know what you're going to see when you go outside to relieve yourself. <laughs> An interesting case for sure. And here is another one which I found super fascinating. I hadn't heard of it before, so I'll, I'd be surprised if you have. 
I call this one, Three Young Girls See a Humanoid. And this is an amazing encounter, which is really quite unusual. It occurred on November 23rd, 1954 in Torpo, Norway. And it's really quite well authenticated with landing traces and multiple witnesses. And it really affected the three young girls who saw this UFO and ET quite profoundly, as we shall see. School had just ended, and three girls, including 10-year-old Anne Stordahl, her sister Tora, age 9, and their friend Tora Moy Haugo, also age 9, were all taking a shortcut through the woods to reach their homes in the small town of Torpo. This is in Norway again, November 23rd, 1954. And they were walking near some high tension lines when something very strange happened. It was Tora Stordahl who noticed it first, a strange black dot way high up in the sky. And as she watched it move, she said at tremendous speed, coming closer and closer and growing in size. She said it kind of arced down at a 45 degree angle coming towards them. And in a matter of just a few seconds, she could now see that this black dot was actually a spherical shaped craft of some kind. She thought momentarily it might be a helicopter, but as it got close, it was pretty obvious to her that it was something else much more strange, especially when she watched it move over the high tension lines, stop for a moment, and then it moved so low it actually brushed the treetops, sending down a volume of snow right onto her body. So this had her attention, but as it moved, this object became hidden by the tree branches. So Tora, although a little uneasy, was also very curious, and she reversed her path and began to actually run up the hill to get a better look at this object. However, she had taken only a few steps when this craft actually, she said, began to follow her. It came up from behind the trees, passed right over the 60,000 volt high tension wires and continued down between the two rows of electric poles. This is how low it was until it descended until it was about three or four feet directly over her head. So incredibly close. And she could now see it very clearly. She described it as a round sphere about 10 feet in diameter. And as she says in her own words, it looked like a stone, like a ball, about 10 feet across. The lowest part was black, but trimmed with yellow spots, which could have been made of glass, and there were also a number of small red jags. And she also noticed that as this craft, quote, came down towards me, it had a long white tail behind. So looking at the top section, she could see that the upper part was totally transparent. In fact, she could see right through it, and she could see the trees on the other side. But what really caught her attention was that there was a man sitting in the center of this top section. She said he was dressed completely in black, though she could only see the upper half of his body. She could see that his hands were holding what looked like a lever of some kind, which he was apparently manipulating as he came right over her head. It then looked to her like he was pressing a number of buttons on this lever. Now she couldn't see much of his face, but she did notice that this humanoid had huge eyes which were covered by immensely large red goggles. This is what it looked like to her. But what really frightened her is when this man turned his head and looked down straight at her. And this caused her to become hysterical with fear. Now at this point, Tora was the only one of the three girls who had seen this craft but then it moved towards her friend, Tora Moy, rising up slightly, at which point it apparently struck the high tension lines themselves. This did cause a shower of sparks, and this sent Tora Moy also into a complete panic. And it was at this exact time that 10-year-old Anne heard this strange droning sound, turned around just in time, 
to see this craft move over Tora Moy and then rise up and hit the tension lines, sending down all these sparks. Now, the younger Tora, or age nine, and sister, she noticed that as the craft started to move away, she said, quote, turned and moved up. The tail went first. That was very funny, I thought. And she also noticed a strange odor, which she compared to, quote, fried sausages. But at this point, all three girls were absolutely hysterical, in a complete panic. They did not really wait to see if this craft was following them or leaving. They just ran straight home. Now, Anne and Tora's mother, Sidzel, was cleaning the floor, waiting for her children when they came running into the kitchen, she says at 3.20 p.m. And as Sidzel Stordal says in her own words, I knew at once that something was wrong. The girls were scared out of their wits. And when I asked them what was the matter, they told me that they had seen a big transparent stone which came down from the sky, and inside the stone was sitting a man who stared at them. Now, Tora Moy Hoga's mother, Miss Lava Ho Hogo, said, Tora Moy told me that the man had been dressed in a black suit and had worn big red glasses, and before the stone disappeared, the man had bent his head and looked at her. So the girls were so frightened that they were practically incoherent, and it actually took a few days before their parents could get the whole story out of them. As Miss Hogo says, her daughter had never been so frightened in her entire life, and she actually remained traumatized for several days afterwards. Later, all three girls were interviewed separately by researchers, all told the same details. And in fact, researcher Advar J. Larson listened to a recording of the interviews, and he says, and I quote, What really got me was the trustworthiness of everybody. There could be no doubt whatsoever that something really had taken place. Not only did the stories match, but the girls used words and expressions which they couldn't have invented if they tried hard, and neither could there be any doubt as to the enthusiasm with which they spoke. So after the girls shared their story and explained what happened, the adults in the area immediately went to the scene to investigate. Of course, the craft and the occupant was gone, but below the high-tension wires and between the electric poles, exactly where the girls had seen this craft hovering, they did find a 75-foot-long streak in the snow. And in fact, an army lieutenant later showed up and took a photograph of it. Now, everyone who knew the girls, they were all absolutely convinced that they were telling the truth about what they saw. But what exactly they saw still remains a mystery to this day. What a case that was. I can't imagine a UFO coming that close to me within feet. Uh, having an E.T. stare down at you, a human-looking E.T. apparently, though they couldn't say for sure, given that it was all dressed up in this black clothes and had these giant red goggles, or so it appeared, over its face. But yeah, a very close-up encounter with landing traces. I thought the unusual smell of, quote, sausages... <laughs> Uh, was pretty interesting, though I have to say it's not unique. I've heard that before. But yeah, a super interesting encounter that was very well researched as well. So I think it's an important case. And here's another case, which did enjoy some recent publicity on Facebook. It certainly caught my eye because it is so unusual. I call this one the Alien Tourists. And you may have heard of it. This was my first time seeing it recently on Facebook. So I dug a little deeper and got some more information about it. It occurred on September 29, 1965, near Arboga, Sweden. I like this case because it does have two witnesses. It's a broad daylight sighting, very close up, somewhat long lasting, and just super unusual, as we shall see. This case was investigated by Swedish researchers Eric Peterson and Thorvald Bertelsen, and it was published in the Swedish publication UFO Info. 
And it has received considerable publicity, I think probably because it was so unusual. It again occurred on September 29, 1965, and the main witnesses were a married couple by the name of Emil and Ada Carlson, who lived in Arboga, Sweden. It was about 6.30 p.m., and Emil and Ada were in the front yard of their home, this is just outside of Arboga, when movement overhead caught their attention. And looking up, they saw something very strange. A large boat-shaped object filled with people passing at very low level overhead. It was totally silent. They estimate this object was about 40 feet long. It had no markings on it. It was gray in color and it glowed with a dim light. But it was, again, yeah, kind of boat-shaped. The upper half was open to the air, and inside were about 20, maybe 25 people, all visible only from the torso upwards, and all of them were dressed in very colorful clothing. All of them were looking down at the couple and the surrounding environment with apparent interest, much like tourists, they thought. So these people did look like ordinary humans, although their clothing according to the witnesses, had all the colors of the rainbow, and it kind of reminded the couple of raincoats. They did notice that none of these figures wore any hats or headgear of any kind, and they all appeared to be standing together, pretty tightly packed, in fact. As they watched, this object moved at an angle from the southeast to the southwest, turning. Emil and Ada estimated that it was about 150 feet higher than the nearby Arboga Church Tower, which itself stands about 180 feet high. So this object was at an estimated elevation of about 330 feet, pretty low. And as it passed overhead, at one point the object tilted sharply, allowing Emil and Ada to get a good view of its width and all the people in it. This object then turned towards the northwest and moved off slowly, disappearing into the distance. While it was in view for about three minutes, the Carlsons had no close neighbors to call out to, so they just watched it together as it moved off, and both were convinced that they had seen, quote, a group of tourists, who they believe were probably from another world. I have to say, I have not heard of a case quite like that, with the shape of a UFO very much like a boat, and... E.T.'s just looking down like tourists. That does seem to be one of the explanations for E.T.'s visiting our planet. Maybe they're not necessarily having an agenda to intervene or do all kinds of things with us. Sometimes they're here just to take a little look-see. And that's what apparently happened in this case. Hard to say for sure, because often one person's sighting is another person's onboard experience. But given that this craft looked like it was packed from front to end with about 20 different human-looking, apparently, ETs, I'm not so sure that they were there to pick anyone up. But what an interesting sighting that is. I can only imagine what it must have been like for that couple. All right, moving along. Here's another really fascinating case. This one's actually a series of cases. This is probably the most extensive case in this little presentation. It's certainly one of my favorite because it's so unusual. There's landing traces, there's a lot of witnesses, some really interesting physiological effects, apparently photographs, though we don't get to see them. As often turns out, they apparently were covered up. But I call this one Landings and Humanoids at Waynesboro, Virginia. This occurred over a period of two months, December 21st, 1964, through January 26th, 1965. It involves at least three major landings, uh, two which involve humanoids, but really <laughs> there are numerous sightings that are connected directly to this mini wave of encounters over Waynesboro, Virginia. And wow, I mean, this one is a doozy. It's very hard to say for sure what encounter was the first in this very interesting wave of UFO encounters in the Waynesboro, Virginia area. 
But the first to gain widespread attention occurred on December 21, 1964, along Highway 250 between Fishersville and Staunton to a gentleman by the name of Horace Burns. He had just driven about a quarter mile east of the Woodrow Wilson Rehab Center, almost right next to it, when he saw a large metallic object shaped somewhat like a beehive. As he watched it moved over his car from left to right, he instantly saw it had no wings, no seams, no visible portholes. This was during the day. He got a very good look at it. He estimated it was about 125 feet in diameter and 80 feet high. So pretty big. He said the engine of his car, a 1958 Mercury station wagon, instantly cut off and he rolled to a stop, quote, just as if I'd run out of gas. And as he watched, this object descended to the ground and landed in the field right by him. And he watched in amazement as it, quote, rested for 60 or 90 seconds. And then, according to Horace, this object rose up, tilted to the side, and flew off to the northwest with a whooshing sound at great speed. He immediately restarted his car, told his wife what happened, and then he contacted a UFO organization headed by Professor Ernest Jemin. Now, this investigator did take down Horace's testimony then he got the school's Geiger counter and returned to the spot where he says he measured radioactivity where the craft had landed. And as he says, in fact, quote, it knocked the needle off the dial. So apparently, pretty strong readings here. He contacted the Air Force's Project Blue Book, who actually sent over Sergeants Dave Moody and Harold Jones. And they said that, quote, the witness appeared normal. He exhibited no indications of suffering from mental disorders. And in fact, Sergeant Moody said, quote, This is an unusual sighting. It does not conform with any known aircraft. And he said that they had no explanation for what Horace Burns had seen. However, <laughs> this was short-lived, because they then turned around and concluded that Horace had simply hallucinated the entire experience. As Sergeant Jones later wrote in his report for Project Blue Book, quote, I think we need a psychiatrist here. What does a person need to eat to see a traveling beehive? So they're basically just ridiculing the witness. Naturally, both Horace Burns and Ernest Jemin disagreed and felt that the Air Force was trying to cover up the sighting. And probably they were, because as it turned out, there was another witness who had seen a strange object in the same area at the same time Horace had his sighting. In fact, the other witness's sighting was reported in the Richmond, Virginia newspaper, The Times Dispatch. And furthermore, Ernest learned that several people in the area had reported weird electromagnetic disturbances, including their house lights dimming and their TVs and radios not working for several minutes. Finally, over the next few weeks, there were more than 30 other, count that, 30 new reports coming in from all over Augusta County, which included not only Fisherville, but the adjacent towns of Dooms, Verona, and Waynesboro. But events weren't over yet. This next encounter to really get a lot of attention came from a gentleman who at first requested anonymity but his name leaked out pretty quickly. We now know him to be William Blackburn of Waynesboro, Virginia. And his encounter involved humanoids. It was on January 19, 1965, uh, and he was chopping wood for the fireplace at the local Augusta County Archery Club. This is located just off Route 250 near Brands Flats, and this is only about a mile or so distant from where Horace Burns had his encounter. Now, it was about 5.40 p.m. when William noticed two silent metallic objects hovering overhead about 3,000 feet high 
he's estimating. One of these objects was about 60 feet wide, and the other was much larger, about 240 feet wide. Now, Williams said the larger object was conical shaped, but the smaller one looked roughly saucer shaped, and in fact, it had a little bubble like cupola on top. Both, he said, were polished silver metal. And as he watched, the smaller one landed only about 45 feet away from him. And he now saw as a pie like section in the craft opened and out stepped three short humanoids. He said each of them were dressed in a shiny silver jumpsuit. And they started to float towards him. He could now see that they were very short, about three feet tall, pretty much human looking, except he said that they had a reddish orange skin, very long fingers. He noticed that they all wore thick soled shoes, but he was mostly impressed by their eyes, as he said, quote, they seemed to look right through you. That's certainly a common quote among UFO witnesses. But according to William, these figures approached right up to him, stopping only about 12 feet away. He said they carried no weapons, they made no hostile motions. He said that he was, quote, not a brave man. But when they confronted him, he froze in place. And he says that these little men began to talk to him in an unintelligible language. And after a few minutes of this, they sort of turned around and entered back into the craft. And he was amazed because he watched this door close and saw that it, quote, seemed to mold itself to the ship. So there were no seams or any sign of any door after it closed. After it closed, the craft immediately took off. And as William says in his own words, during the confrontation, the door to the object remained, giving off a strange light, but the outside shell gave off no light. I never saw polished metal like that in my life. I'll bet you couldn't see that thing at 5,000 feet on a clear day. I didn't used to believe in these things. This thing made me a believer. So this was a fairly long encounter. William estimates that the whole incident from start to finish lasted about a half hour. And afterwards, recognizing the importance of what he saw, he immediately wrote everything down and actually mailed it to himself in a sealed envelope so that if anyone else reported something similar, he would be able to prove that he had seen it himself and provide confirmation of his own encounter. Now he did tell his story to the newspaper on the condition that he remain anonymous, but again his name soon became known as word of his encounter spread fast. Now, unfortunately nobody else saw the humanoids, however there were at least three separate independent reports of UFOs sighted in the immediate area on that same night. And it was some period of time after his encounter that Williams says that he was visited by government agents, he would not say who, who told him that he was not to talk about his sighting. Now, Richard Hall of NICAP, he and other investigators said that they actually found evidence that supported Williams' claims of being silenced. Researchers did look into the area of the sighting and did not find any landing traces, but they did speak with people who knew William well, and they all vouched for his honesty and integrity. And after interviewing William himself, researcher Richard Hall said, quote, To us, Blackburn seemed very honest and sincere, able to express himself well, and a man of considerable practical experience and intelligence. So, following this, there were more sightings, and it was one week later, in the early evening, that another amazing encounter occurred. This one involved a group of six teenage witnesses, including 16-year-old Steve Huffer. They were driving in the same exact area, along Highway 250, when they said that they saw, quote, what looked like a man walking. Now, this man was walking towards the road from the field along the highway, 
And they really didn't think anything of it until this figure sat down alongside the highway and began to watch the cars pass by. And as they got close to him, they could now see that this figure was very short. They estimate about three feet tall, and he was wearing a silver one-piece uniform, pretty much exactly like William Blackburn described. So they had heard about the recent UFO reports, so Steve and his friends stopped the car and they immediately got out and pursued this little man. And as they ran towards him, this little man jumped up and began running. And they said that two other short humanoids appeared, joined the first one, and all three of these little men easily outdistanced the boys. Now these small figures quickly disappeared off into the distance and Steve and his friends were really surprised to see that there were no visible footprints on the ground even though it was reportedly very muddy in this area. So they immediately rushed to the police. They explained that these three figures ran off at high speed. As Steve said, they left us way behind. Now the police were skeptical, but to their credit, they did send out no less than 16 officers. And there was an amateur photographer, Charles Weaver, who joined them and they all went to the area together. They were unable to find anything, so they all left, all the officers. Everyone left except for Steve Huffer and the photographer, Charles Weaver. Now by this time it was fully dark, but they continued to search the area. And it's a good thing they did because to their amazement, they came upon a landed object, which they said looked to them like, quote, a glowing aluminum barn. Both Steve and Charles began to approach. Steve just wanted to investigate, but Charles wanted to get a photograph. And as they walked up to this thing, suddenly, some weird invisible force struck Charles, injuring him and kind of stopping him in his tracks. And as Steve says, quote, the whole left side of his face was blood red and his eyes had a peculiar red glow. So this, of course, stopped them in their tracks. Both men turned to run, but as they did so, Charles Weaver, the photographer, stopped momentarily and snapped a photograph. And they both said that in the flash of the flash bulb of the camera, they could see this little man standing by the object. Naturally, they returned to the police station. The police chief tried to write it all off as a hoax. But Steve Huffer's mother said that her son was an honest and, quote, hard-working boy. She also said that he was, quote, white as a sheet after he told her what happened or as he told her. So this was apparently enough for the Air Force, who reportedly showed up at the service station where Charles Weaver worked, and they took him and his camera to Washington, and nothing ever was heard from him after this. The story actually does not end here, in what appears to be a deliberate attempt to debunk, to debunk the testimony of Steve and his friends, a man by the name of Donald Cash says, he makes this claim, he says that the E.T. that the boys thought they saw was really him and he was playing a prank. Apparently without knowing any details about what Steve and his friends actually saw, Donald Cash, who by the way is about 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighs 190 pounds, says that he dressed up in a blue jumpsuit and played this prank on the boys pretending to be an E.T., and he says that it was he who was chased by Steve Huffer and his friends. As he told newspapers, It shook me up. I didn't know what they would do if they got their hands on me. Now this is absolutely ridiculous. None of uh, Donald Cash's claims come anywhere close to matching what the boys said they saw. Despite this, several newspapers picked up the story and printed the prank explanation. Now, researcher Jerome Clark calls this an attempt to, quote, discredit the story. And he says, quote, one wonders at the gullibility of the news media, which treated Cash's confession quite seriously, despite the fantastic incongruities between his claims of Huffer 
and photographer Charles Weaver. As we shall see, practically every detail of the latter report contradicts Cash's peculiar account. And I told you that's an amazing series of events, and I think probably there's a lot more to it than was presented here, given that this wave, the publicity for it rather, was shut down pretty hard by what appears to be the Air Force and the government stepping in to debunk sightings and threaten witnesses, perhaps. There's not direct evidence of this, but given that the photographer, we never heard from him, uh, mm, looks like that this was pretty effectively covered up. Thankfully, we do know about it. It's an important series of sightings, and it just goes to show how one sighting that gets publicity inspires other people to come forth. So this could be happening a lot more than we realize. We just don't hear about it. It's truly unfortunate. Most people do not report their sightings. This cover-up has been that effective. It's one of the reasons I do this research. I'm not taking it anymore. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. People need to know the truth. So that's why I do this research. Certainly that's one of the primary reasons that, and it's just so darn fascinating. Which brings me to our next case. This one is what we would define as a simple UFO sighting, but I don't think it's that simple. I call this one a 13-mile UFO chase. This occurred on January 5, 1971, near Windsor, Australia, and it's an amazing and truly dramatic encounter. As I'm sure you know, UFOs do seem to have a penchant for chasing cars down lonely highways at night, and that is what is happening here. The question is why? Why are they doing this? Well, let's just take a look at this case, and perhaps we can come up with some motivations for this. I'm not sure. Now, who doesn't like a good UFO car chase story? Because there are so many. And here's another. It was around 10 p.m., again on January 5, 1971, as 37-year-old John Klukas drove to his home located in Windsor, New South Wales, Australia. He had just passed the town of Penrith and had about 13 miles until he reached his home in Windsor when it happened. A bright light zoomed down from the sky and began to follow his car. And as John says in his own words, it came up very quickly and I soon saw it was much bigger than any car light. When I slowed down, it would not pass me. When I speeded up, it would catch up in a flash. Now, this object wasn't huge, he says. It was pretty small, maybe about three feet in diameter, though he couldn't be sure. But for the next 13 miles, he says this object chased his car down the highway. It would sometimes hang back about a quarter mile behind him, then zoom forward until it was only a few feet from his back bumper, literally tailgating him. And he says that no matter what he did, slow down or speed up, he could not shake this UFO. And it was bright. As John says, quote, The light illuminated the whole inside of my car and blinded me when I looked in the rearview mirror. So, finally, upon almost reaching Windsor, John stopped his car and remained there, ready to confront this strange alien visitor. <laughs> Only then did this object suddenly zoom away. Now, John at first remained quiet about his encounter, but after hearing about a couple in Perth who had had a similar experience on a lonely highway, he decided to share his encounter with reporters. And again, it's just one of countless examples of UFOs exhibiting this strange behavior of chasing cars down lonely roads late at night. So there you go. Another one of what must be hundreds of cases in which UFOs change, chase cars down lonely highways, usually at night. So what's going on here? Why do they do that? I can only speculate, but I suspect it's just a way of letting people know in, unequi in an unequivocal way that they are real, that UFOs are real. I don't know. It's very strange. It's a very much type of encounter that I would call a display where they want themselves to be seen because there's simply no mistaking it. 
when a UFO is tailgating you down the highway, really just a few feet off your bumper, and then darting away and zooming back up. I mean, that's dramatic for sure. All right, now we move to another case which I had to include because it is beyond bizarre. And I call this one the UFO that sucked. Yeah, you heard me right, the UFO that sucked. <laughs> this one occurred in the summer of 1973 in England and was investigated by a British UFO researcher. It appears to be totally legitimate, although really unusual unique even, and involves not just one or two events, but quite a number of them involving this UFO that was sucking stuff up into the air across the countryside. I think you'll find it quite interesting and bizarre. This very bizarre case was investigated by the British UFO Research Organization, Bufora, but primarily by one of their members by the name of Derek James. And it involves a series of truly bizarre events connected to an apparent UFO. The first report come, came from a group of people who pulled off the road near Jodrell Bank, again in England. It was mid-afternoon on a sunny summer day, 1973. All of the witnesses said that they observed this black, sort of indistinct object which was hovering at a low elevation, about 750 feet up in the air. Now that alone was strange enough, but what really drew everyone's attention was that a column of straw was being sucked up into the air directly beneath the object from a field. And it was doubly odd because they could see no sign of any wind. The air was still. And in fact, one of the witnesses actually exited his car and stood in the center of the field with the straw, straw rising all around him, but still he felt no wind. Now, reportedly there were photographs taken, but researchers have not been able to obtain them. And if this was an isolated report, it would be interesting enough, but it's not, because as Bufora investigators soon learned, it was just one of many weird events that occurred on this same day. It turned out earlier that day, a lady at Cheshire Plains, this is about seven miles to the west, she had gone outside and seen a Goodyear airship pass overhead and was still looking at the sky when a few miles behind it, she saw a, quote, funny black cloud. And she said that hovering above this black cloud was a, quote, brilliant star. And it was strange because it kept blinking in and out. And she watched it, and she says it was actually sailing against the breeze towards the southeast. And the next report, this is so weird, came from a train driver at Kidlington, who told researchers that as he sat in the cab of his train, he watched a very heavy sack of coal suddenly take off upwards and travel straight beside him. So <laughs> something is making this bag of coal levitate. That cannot be a whirlwind or anything. At any rate, the next witnesses include residents of the town Chell in Stoke-on-Trent, and they watched as a field of hay was sucked up into the air and actually dumped one mile away in Burslem. And numerous people in between these two towns saw not only the hay, <laughs> but all kinds of items being sucked up, apparently into this same strange black cloud. All of the witnesses, several of who were interviewed on radio and television, said that the strangest thing about it is that, again, there was no wind. Now, before I never really published anything on this case, and it later appeared only in the publication North UFO News. I have to say, I don't know what's going on with that case. Again, it does appear to be totally legitimate, but it's so bizarre. I don't know. <laughs> One thing I do feel for sure is that this wasn't a whirlwind, as was put forth by skeptical uh, people who tried to explain this away, because certainly all the witnesses said that they felt no wind. So it seemed to be some other force that was pulling these objects up into the air. 
And as of course I'm sure you know, UFOs do have that ability to levitate people, animals, and all kinds of things up into them. So that appears to be what's going on here. Perhaps it's another example of a display. Whatever the explanation, it's a really unusual, unique case that I think deserves to be well known, which is why I included it in this little presentation. And now we move to the next case. I call this one, The UFO Made Her Cry. It occurred on October 13, 1977, in a remote area known as Wetzel County. This is in Virginia. What's interesting about this case, for me certainly, is that people often do have a really strong emotional reaction to a UFO encounter. And this is absolutely true in this case, though her reaction even surprised the witness herself. This very poignant case comes from researcher Gray Barker, and it occurred in a very remote area of Wetzel County, West Virginia. It was around 8.30 p.m. on October 13, 1977, that Mary Arnett and her sister Shelby Lowe were driving home along the forested country one-lane Mobley Road. In the backseat of the car were their two friends, Pam and Teresa Hott, also sisters. And I'll just quote Mary directly, as she says, Suddenly, my eyes seemed to be drawn upward at the sky where I saw a brilliant object. The oddest part was my emotional reaction. Immediately, tears started rolling down my cheeks, as if I didn't have control over my own crying. Maybe it could have been the light from the thing, only it didn't seem to be all that brilliant. So this really perplexed herself. <laughs> and Mary, who was driving, slammed on the brakes. She yelled for the others to look, and all four witnesses watched this classic flying saucer glide smoothly overhead at low level. They described it as a silver disc with a dome on top. They could see an antenna protruding from the top of the dome. The bottom of the disc, they said, had three little landing legs. And they said that the craft had two flashing lights, one red and one blue, though the entire craft itself also glowed with light. They really weren't sure how big it was, or exactly how high, but they said it appeared, quote, about as big as an airliner, and it did seem quite low. And in fact, as they watched, this object tilted downward and descended in a smooth gliding motion right over the treetops of a nearby mountain. And they actually thought it was about to land, and this quite frightened all of them. And it was Mary who was driving. She decided that it was best that they just drive away. As Mary says, we had just started the car and driven a few hundred feet when my sister screamed, Oh my God, look back. So Mary and the others all looked back, and as she says, quote, the woods on the mountain were lighted up like a football stadium. Now that was enough for all of them. They fled the scene. Afterwards, Mary dropped off Pam and Teresa, and they returned home with Shelby. So they did tell their family what happened, uh, who were quite skeptical, as it turns out. And the sisters wanted to return the next day and climb the mountain where they had seen this UFO to investigate. But nobody in their family would accompany them, so they didn't go. And as Mary says, I suppose the reason we didn't ever investigate was that all of us were just too chicken. Fascinating case for sure. Daylight sighting, multiple witnesses very close up, and of course the strange emotional reaction. I think when somebody sees something that appears suddenly and is completely out of their worldview, it's no surprise that you might react in very strange and strong emotional ways. So yeah, while it did frighten them, she also had that really interesting <laughs> reaction of just suddenly weeping. Uh, it's, it's a big deal when you have something that suddenly confronts you that changes the way you think about everything. So I suspect that's what was going on there. But yeah, an absolutely interesting case. As is this next one, I think. I call this one a box-shaped UFO with humanoids. I love this case because the witness 
seems to be such a sincere, sweet, innocent, and intelligent child. And while she is the only witness, she described it in such vivid detail that the, wit the investigators were certainly convinced it's an absolute, genuine encounter. It occurred in November 1978 at West Bank, British Columbia, in Canada, of course. This is very near Lake Okanagan, the location of many other encounters, and coincidentally, a lake monster, Ogopogo, who is quite well known. I'm not saying there's any connection there, but I do find it interesting. And yeah, this is a fascinating encounter involving humanoids. This case was investigated by researcher Bill Allen, and it was about 6 a.m. on November in November of 1978. And the main witness is Dawn Smith, pictured here. She's a plucky, independent nine-year-old girl, and she lay down in bed because, as it turns out, her mother had just left for work, and Dawn was hoping to get a little more sleep. But she didn't, not this morning. <laughs> Instead, something very strange outside her window caught her attention. And I'll just quote Dawn directly. As she says, I saw a big light in the sky, and a little one moving up and down. The big light was like a shoebox, and had green lights down one side. The other light was white, and it was swaying as it went up and down. It stopped for a while, and then it went up and down again. Then the shoebox opened a door, like a garage door, and this little light went inside. The door closed, and the shoebox went behind a rain cloud but I could still see it because the cloud only half covered it. Now she says this object appeared box-shaped, was quite large. She says about half the apparent size of a full moon. It had green lights on one side and the other was outlined with what looked like red lights. She was looking up at it from a 45 degree angle and was amazed to see two dark figures, humanoids, standing like, quote, guards at each side of the door. Now, she didn't get a real good look at him, but they looked human. And as Dawn says, quote, I was scared because I didn't know what the thing was. I thought it was going to come down and get me. It was halfway down to my house, and I thought it was looking at me. Now, she does say that the interior of this object was lit with a dim light, and although she couldn't see much detail, she believed that these figures were wearing dark uniforms. But the encounter wasn't over yet, because as she watched, an ob this object came out of the cloud again, and it did something that absolutely amazed Dawn. As Dawn says, again in her own words, it came back out and opened the door again, and a flying saucer came out. When it went in, it was just a little round light. And when it came out, it was like a flying saucer with lights going around it. They were red and yellow and orange. It had a little hook on top, perhaps a little dome. Either way, these little lights were revolving around the rim of the saucer, or the craft itself was spinning. Dawn really wasn't sure which. But seeing this saucer emerge, her curiosity overcame her fear, and she rushed to the window to get a better look. But at this point, the saucer was suddenly nowhere to be seen. As Dawn says, it was getting light and the lights were gone. She did immediately call her friend Sandy and told her what happened. Researchers confirmed this. They spoke with Sandy as well as Dawn. And Sandy confirmed that Dawn had in fact called her and sounded very frightened by her experience. UFOs do seem to come in all shapes and sizes, and I think a lot of that is probably due to perspective, perhaps misperception, overlaying of our own belief systems, or, you know, not great observation. I don't know. It's very hard to say, because this witness said it was very close, right over the house, below the cloud layer. She got a very good look at it. And what's also interesting is one UFO came out of this other one. So that is something we do here fairly often. But yeah, a super interesting case of a UFO with humanoids. And here's another. There's always another case uh, 
So any skeptics who say, ah, oh, there's nothing to this, I mean, hmm, you're just dead wrong. There are far too many cases to explain away as misperceptions or hoaxes or hallucinations as our governments would have us think. It always surprises me when people are so skeptical because really they're just victims of the UFO cover-up. We've been made to think that way when really there's every reason in the world to believe that these encounters are happening. Because again, a lot of them do have evidence. A lot of them have multiple witnesses. And this next case has some really interesting landing trace cases. I call this next case the Odense Landing and Humanoids. This is one of my favorite in the bunch, just because it's so unusual. The witness was able to walk right up to this UFO, saw the humanoids very close up, and this one was professionally investigated as well. There's a lot to it. It is somewhat brief in terms of the information we have, but I think you'll find it quite interesting. It occurred on July 16, 1982, just outside of the small town of Odense, Denmark. And yeah, it's quite a case. It was around 4.45 a.m., again on July 16, 1982, as a 15-year-old young man who has insisted upon anonymity. He was employed at a local gardening company, and he was bicycling to work from the town of Odense to Broby along the Sohusdej Road. And he says, coming out of the woods, coming around a corner, he noticed a bright light about 150 feet away in the field to his right. So he immediately thought this, this was unusual. So he got off his bike and walked partway into the field to investigate. And to his absolute astonishment, he came upon a classic flying saucer landed on the ground. And he estimates it was about six feet wide, maybe six feet high. It glowed bright white and had no markings at all except for this doorway on one side. And no sooner did he see this object when he immediately noticed five short humanoids standing nearby, about 30 to 45 feet away. And he said they were not human. They were only three feet tall. They had big, bald heads, long pointed ears, broad chests, but very narrow hips and very short legs. Now, the grass in this field was growing thickly, and it looked to the witness that four of these humanoids were walking, quote, on top of the grass. You could see that they were apparently taking soil samples and putting them in these small bags that they carried. Now, the fifth humanoid, he stood apart, and he appeared to be supervising or standing guard over the others. This was the witness's impression. But it was this fifth humanoid who suddenly noticed the witness approaching. Now, by this time, he's about six feet away from the object itself. And this apparently alarmed these ETs because instantly they all rushed into the craft, which took off with a loud whooshing sound, which the witness had almost sounded like growling. But at this point, they entered the object, the door closed, the object flared up in a brilliant light that was so bright it forced the witness to shield his eyes with his hands, and then this object flew off over the electric wires towards the town of Odense. Now, looking at where the saucer had rested on the ground, the witness saw that the grass was depressed and perhaps even a little bit darkened. He immediately finished this 15-mile bike ride to the town of Broby where he worked, and told his boss what he had seen. Unfortunately, his boss was skeptical and said he must have been dreaming, dreamt the whole thing. Uh, naturally, this upset the witness and fearing ridicule from others, he initially told nobody else until a few months later after he attended a UFO lecture. Now, he did tell his parents, who absolutely believed their son, as they knew he was not the kind of person who fantasized. But after going to this UFO lecture, the witness did file a report with the SUFOI, the Scandinavian UFO Research Information Organization, and he was put in touch with investigator Inge H. Svein. 
Now, Svein and other researchers interviewed the witness, and they found him to be credible and trustworthy. Uh, the witness did not want to give the name of his employer. That was the only thing that puzzled the investigators, but the witness insisted. At any rate, they did examine the landing spot, which showed no evidence of crushed grass or anything like this. Though, that's probably because several months had elapsed since the investigators were able to get onto the scene. It seems pretty clear to me that in that case, the witness just happened to be in the right place at the right time, given that it was so, so early, early in the morning. The ETs probably weren't expecting anybody to be around, but there was the witness driving right up to them on his bike. An amazing case. And here's another super interesting case, which actually comes from a scientist. So a credible witness for sure. And I call this one the Badlands UFO. This is a really interesting encounter of a landing in a remote area, very close up of encounter with humanoids. And apparently photographic evidence, though as often happens in these cases, we just don't get to see the photographs. It's so frustrating. But what are you going to do? I think it is a legitimate case, given that the witness is so credible. This one occurred in February 1983 in Barber County. This is in South Kansas. And as you'll see, it's a really unusual encounter. This last and final case comes from researcher Aaron Milan. And it first appeared in Timothy Green Beckley's publication, UFO Review. The sole witness to this event is an independent petroleum geologist by the name of Tom Brebel. And at the time, he was working for an out-of-state oil field development company to explore the Badlands area of South Kansas. This is west of Medicine Lodge. It's a remote plain, but crisscross with gullies. It's largely flat, but has these you know, steep gullies in it, and it's very much inaccessible to vehicles and really unusable for farming or grazing. Certainly at that time, it was not easily accessible. So it was a cold, misty night, again, February 1983, as Tom was in this area getting ready for bed, and he climbed into his tent. And I'll just quote the main witness, Tom, directly. As he says, it gets dark early out there at this time of year. I fired up my Coleman lantern and worked on the day's reports for a couple of hours. Then I crawled into my sleeping bag at probably 7.30 or 8 p.m. There was just nothing else to do out there, so you sleep. There was not a sound of any kind outside the tent. The drizzle had been falling steadily since mid-morning, and now the entire landscape was cloaked in fairly heavy fog as well. You could look outside and see absolutely nothing. It was spooky, and to tell you the truth, I felt just a little bit uneasy. Now we eventually did fall asleep, but in the middle of the night, something woke him up. As Tom says, I had the strangest sensation that someone was watching me. It was still eerily quiet outside, but as the sensation of being watched grew, Tom doused his Coleman lantern, opened the tent, looked outside and got a huge shock because coming from the east, he saw a strange glow penetrating through the fog and trees and along with it, he could hear a low humming noise. So again, I will just quote Tom directly. As he says, I probably sat crouched in the doorway five minutes or so. I'm not really sure why, but I threw the camera strap over my neck before I ventured outside. I must have gone about a quarter of a mile or so. The light and sound kept getting stronger. Suddenly, I came to the edge of a sheer drop-off, and there it was, maybe a hundred feet away, down inside this rather large gully, was a huge round apparatus with orange lights pulsating first bright, then dim, all around the circumference. The sound was much louder by this time, and I could feel the soft bank vibrating beneath me. I was scared, but I was fascinated, almost hypnotized at the same time. My first impulse was to run away, but I couldn't. I just couldn't turn my back on such a phenomenon as this. 
The low vibrations seem so soothing and peaceful. I can't explain it. So Tom estimates that this craft was quite large, about 50 feet in diameter, maybe 10 feet tall in the center and tapering off towards the edges, but was definitely saucer shaped. And he had his camera with him, so he opened it up. This was a Polaroid SX70, and he snapped a picture. Now this kind of camera is a pretty loud camera, and he says that in the silence, it seemed to make a lot of noise. And he was about to take another picture, and this was when he noticed two glowing blue forms in the camera's viewfinder. And as he says in his own words, they were solid objects because they blocked out the lights on the craft behind them. They were roughly the size of 10-year-old kids. I don't know whether they were alien beings in spacesuits or robots or local farmers playing weird costume games or what, but I went ahead and snapped the picture anyhow. So he's clearly puzzled as to what these figures were, and he says that as soon as he snapped the figures, he felt his body being hurled down the side of the ditch. And as Tom says, I don't know whether I got scared and fell, or whether the wet bank just gave way at that moment, or whether someone or something made me fall. I don't know whether I hit my head and knocked myself out during the fall, or whether some force caused me to lose consciousness. All he knows is that the next thing he knew, he was waking up out of a sleep, and it was now beginning to get light. So he's really not sure how long he was unconscious, but he was happy to see that he had sustained no serious injuries. By this time, there was no sign of any object, no humanoids, nor were there any landing traces that he could see. He says that there were no other after effects other than the shock of the encounter itself. As Tom says, I can almost convince myself that it never happened, except for the pictures. Unfortunately, what the pictures show, Tom doesn't say. The researcher did not provide any other details, and Tom apparently has provided no further interviews about his experience, so that's where it remains. Hopefully the photographs will one day surface. I honestly don't think so. Most of these cases, they're reported, if at all, and then they just kind of slip into obscurity. It's one of the reasons I do this research, just to record all of this for posterity. So people know that encounters are happening all over the world. And this case is a good example. I also find it interesting that this UFO is landing in an area which has some very interesting geological features. In fact, that's why the witness was there. I also find it interesting because the witness describes the Oz factor that we often hear about with an eerie silence and he had the distinct sensation someone was looking at him or watching over the area, which is what drew him out of his tent. So yeah, a lot of interesting features to that case, which tell us a lot about the UFO phenomena, and frankly ourselves, our ability to sense these things. So an interesting case, I think, all around. That's it for today, 10 cases from all over the world, stretching a number of decades, Cases with multiple witnesses, cases with all different types of ETs, cases with all different types of evidence, and just super interesting. <laughs> we still have so much to learn about UFOs, ETs, and ourselves, and these kinds of cases really provide us an opportunity to think outside the box, to consider new paradigms, to really expand our worldview and they are a strong reminder that we are not alone, that we are just one, uh, keep one people here on this planet when there are many other people out there, people very much like us, more alike us, I think, than different. So that's it for today. I want to thank you guys once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. It's because of you I do these presentations, so I truly hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And until next time, keep searching for the truth. Keep asking those hard questions. And most important of all, keep having fun. I know I am. <laughs> Till next time. Bye.